game four coming right up in Pacers Bucks and the dynamics continue to change. Damian Lillard, Achilles injury, doubtful for the game. Of course, that changes things in a significant way. But how? How does that change the desperation level? What other adjustments are there to expect tonight for game four? You'll get it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. y'all happy sunday hope you're enjoying the playoffs and welcome into another edition of the locked on pacers podcast where we of course talk about the indiana pacers as always my name is tony east i cover the team for forbes and si and today game four tonight lots to get you ahead of the game mostly because of the big updates regarding damian lillard and his injury from game three Crazy updates that came late in the night after that game, and then even more on Saturday. And now tonight, the Pacers could be playing the Bucs without their two best players, plus other adjustments to keep an eye out for, both as a result of that and some stuff that we touched on after Game 3 that we can now dive into a little more with numbers rolling in and the focus of the series continuing to shift. But the lead of this is simple. Well, actually, the lead of this is not simple. The big lead, the big picture thing that is simple is explaining what news we got on Saturday, and that is that Damian Lillard, his Achilles injury is bad. Not bad like out for the series bad, but uh, grade one Achilles strain was the report from Chris Haynes, who, of course, um, has reported on Dame very well and up close for years. Uh, the Bucks officially uh, at 530 for their first injury report put – uh, Dame Lillard as doubtful with right Achilles tendonitis. So regardless of the specifics of what it is, Damian Lillard has an Achilles injury. And Shams Trana even put in his report about the injury that Damian Lillard in a walking boot on Saturday. Uh, Dame played 45 minutes during game three. He was still really good. He had a bunch of points and finally got the assist rolling, which is something I've been talking about far too much. You've been listening all series long. But something that caught my eye after the game and I didn't really talk about it much on the show because there were like a million things that happened in game three that we had to talk about, was Doc Rivers, after the game, talking about using Dame as a decoy. He admitted this in his post-game presser. I actually thought that was very interesting. Um, Doc Rivers on Damian Lillard right after game three, his post-game presser, he said, I think it's his Achilles again, so we'll see. And then he said, honestly, Dame was really struggling. In the overtime, he literally said, I'll be the decoy. I just can't go as far as explosion. So I thought Dame just being out there was huge for us. That is fascinating to me. He was playing like that. And you can look back now that I, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, he had that injury in the first quarter where he had collision with Siakam. That wasn't actually the one that made the Achilles bad. You can see it with like seven seconds to go. Right after the inbound, you see Dame kind of cut towards Siakam. There's no contact or anything. And all of a sudden, he starts reaching for his leg. And there it is. Injury pops up. This was right at the end of regulation, like seconds to go until overtime. Dame had 28 and 8 in the game, right? I'm not, I'm not here to disparage the things he did, but you can see his statistical, you know, impact to drop two for six. In the fourth quarter, getting to the foul line is what kept him alive. And then in the OT, played four minutes and 55 seconds, all but the last five seconds, uh, where the, the Bucks were trying to get a stop and brought Andre Jackson in. Zero points, zero shots, one rebound, one assist. That's it, right? He was not as effective in that period. And so that's obviously significant that he would be less effective at all, but he might not play, period, which changes things significantly. I asked her Carlisle about it. It's very similar to what they expect with, expected with Giannis and how they prepped there, which is if they're going to prep like he's playing, even though that, that there's a chance he doesn't. And that sounds silly because the Bucks are prepping like Dame probably won't play because they know more about the injury. But the key part of this is that, and Tyrese Halbert explained this, you prepare for the more difficult outcome, which is that he plays. And I think that does make sense. Uh, Chris Middleton's probable, so no point of talking about him. He was the best player uh, in the game for game three. So... Lillard and Giannis is also doubtful for game four. I think Doc Rivers said that at Saturday that it could be like a hard workout day for Giannis and that you know, that's good, but probably not expecting a hard workout and he plays. Uh, so obviously all that dynamic at play we start with. Game four is massive, massive, massive for the Pacers. If Damon Giannis don't play, 
not a must win. The Pacers are ahead in the series, right? But it's pretty dang close. Uh, and they still have home court advantage. And if they win, they would have a game six at worst at home to win the series. To have that opportunity with two stars out for the other team is massive. And yet everyone's going to say the same thing. And they should all season long. The Pacers had these games with stars out and laid an egg. And the hope would be if you root for the Pacers that the playoffs up their intensity and up their level and they get it done. But you just never know what these guys, they do. They've been up for the playoffs so far without Giannis and they've done well and they're winning the series, but without Giannis and Lillard, they've got to continue that focus. So what does that mean for the game? Right. One of my biggest L's in this postseason, two of them actually have been Dame related. One was after game one saying maybe they need to switch things up and not have on Andrew Nemhard on him. That was a mistake. Nemhard's done very well in that matchup. The other thing I, I thought I've gotten wrong is I thought the part of the biggest reason I picked Pacers in seven before the series started was, you know, you can look back at the, the Bucks regular season and their net ratings with certain guys on the floor. And with Giannis and Dame both off the floor, their net rating was god awful, just an awful team. So my theory for the series was the Pacers will be able to keep up with the Dame Bucks and then crush the Bucks when Dame's off the floor to win enough without Giannis to then win the series. What has actually happened in these games is the Pacers are plus five, which is crazy, by the way, through three games. They lost by 15, won by 17, and then won by three. They are minus, the Bucks are minus 29 with Lillard on the floor. That's insane. So that means the Bucks are plus 34, or the Pacers are plus 34 with Lillard off the floor. They absolutely destroy the minutes when he's not on the floor. Um, unbelievable. That's actually plus 24. I'm not good at math, but either way, plus 24 with Lillard off minus 29 with him on. That's how you get to a plus five for the Pacers in the series. I thought for sure that would be flipped, right? That that's an unbelievable stat to me. So how is that actually happening? Uh, good question. I mean, just looking at the net ratings, the big number that stands out, and this is only 27 minutes. This is an astronomically small sample. Every lineup stat is for three games, but the Bucks. Offensive rating in their no day minutes are plus, or excuse me, not plus, are just 130.8. Insane. Their defensive rating is 88, also insane. And you can really see the small sample size theater when you zoom in really far. In those 27 minutes, the Bucks are shooting 46% from three and 64.3% from two. The Pacers are shooting well from two as well, but the Pacers are shooting 14%, 14.3% from three. If those three point percentages balance at all, that should be enough for the Pacers to do better in those minutes. But maybe there's something to this. Every single game, the Bucs have done well in the no-day minutes. So that's the biggest part of why this has happened, is the Pacers have not shot well at all in those minutes. And the Bucs have done, to their credit, well in those minutes to actually shoot well and survive and, and stay in games. But I don't expect that. And it's been it's very jarring to me that, to see those net ratings flip. It's more impressive in the bigger 122-minute sample that the Pacers have a plus 13.4 net rating with Dame on the floor in the series. They've done very well. So what's the adjustment going to come in the lineup? That is the question I had, and I'm going to guess because I don't know. And the reason I have to guess is the Pacers, excuse me, the Bucks. I'm all over the place. The Bucks all series long have played exactly one lineup with all four starters that they have that aren't Dame and then no Dame. So that would be Portis, Lopez, Middleton, Beverly, and then a fifth player. They've only done that for one second. One second in the series. That's the very end of game three. It was Andre Jackson Jr. Um, so per, uh, that's the only data we've seen where there's a fifth player who's not Dave. Perhaps he starts and Beverly's your one and Andre Jackson's your energy giver. I mentioned after game three that I thought that would be a Bucks adjustment to that continues. They went to it in game three and he was good. Andre Jackson had a nice game. So maybe that's what they do um, because every other lineup they've played in the series with without Dame on the floor has usually only had three starters. They really, really, really have tried. Doc Rivers has to pair Brooke Lopez and Damian Lillard. There have been only six minutes in the entire series through three games where the Bucks have had Brooke Lopez on the floor and no Dame, right? Uh, they've had 21 minutes of no Brooke, no Dame, and that's almost as many Dame, no Brooke minutes, right? Clearly, there's a huge effort to have Lopez and Lillard on the floor together. And so that's why I think that you aren't seeing a lot of the lineups where it's four starters, but Dame's the one off. And obviously he's been their best player. Um, or Well, Middleton was better in game three, but one of their best players in the series so far. So that makes sense. But Lopez specifically pairing with them makes sense. They're a good pick and whatever, pop roll, whatever duo. 
and have been all series. So that's part of this too. So very frequently, you know, you'll see uh, them go three starters and then two bench guys and Lillard's off. Uh, the Bucks' best lineup with Lillard off this series um, is plus 10 in five minutes. And that group is Patrick Beverly, Malik Beasley, Pat Connaughton, Chris Middleton, Bobby Portis. That's a, a lot of ball handling. 16 points on eight possessions for that group. So maybe look for that. Maybe the Pat Connaughton uh, is the guy that they go with as their fifth starter. That's actually my guess for what will actually happen uh, is Pat Connaughton is the starter tomorrow night, tonight for you guys listening. Just because of that, the ball handling, he's like the most natural air quotes two guard on that team, but that's still not, you know, he's he's tallish. It's not a great fill in, um, but that's their most common lineup. But that's two starters in, right? Beasley and for that group instead of Lopez, right? With Portis at the five. So maybe they don't go to that. Um, and if you really dive into their, that's their most played lineup without Lillard and three of their other starters. And then the second most played one has been Connaughton, Lopez, Beverly, Crowder, and Middleton, um, which is interesting. So that's no Portis, but that has Pat Connaughton and Jay Crowder. This is a lot of just gobbledygook of Bucks player names to explain to you that I don't know who's going to start or what the Bucks' natural adjustment is going to be. My 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 prediction, if you made me, if you said gun to your head, who starts now with Dame not playing? If he doesn't play, I suppose he could still play. Pat Connaughton would be my guess. He's been okay in this series. He can handle it the best of any of their bench players who routinely play because if they start let's say they start jay crowder or malik beasley then their all their ball handling is basically middleton and kind of patrick beverly in the starting five and that's just too hard to create shots they need a little more juice to me so again i'm guessing but my guess is pat Connaughton. my second guess would be andre jackson and after that i would be <laughs> i would just be asking why did they choose that so we'll see what they decide to do but no dame is is massive even though the pacers have done well in his minutes if him not playing, I mean, if that that changes what the Pacers can attack, that changes how potent the Bucks' offense is, that changes their strategies, it changes everything. That doesn't need to be said. And if him and Giannis are both not playing for a game, the Pacers have to, have to, have to take advantage. That is my predictions for the lineup. That's what that means for Game 4. The series numbers with Lillard on and off are just, just hilarious. Um, what else is there to watch for in Game 4? Some other strategy stuff that I think will be important in this game coming up with more data and analysis from this series before we get to any of that though. Let's take a short little break so I can talk to you about Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the corner? Well, our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level, like the 2024 Nissan Rogue, which is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built-ins is your always updating assistant to call in for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Plus they have the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder and the 2024 Nissan Armada. The Armada will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to eight in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. Back here on Lockdown Pacers, thanks for making us your first listen on this wonderful weekend day. Hopefully you have enough time to get this in before game four. Make your second listen, Lockdown NBA, to hear about the action for another league Saturday night. And because I hosted it with Gavin Shaw of Lockdown Knicks, diving into the Lakers surviving, the Cavs Magic Series being super weird, and the Thunder just pummeling the Pelicans over and over, and the Celtics remembered that they're the Celtics. Um, you can hear me talk about that over there. Here we're talking, of course, about the Pacers heading in to game four. A lot of this stuff is going to be stuff I talked about a little bit uh, after the last game, but it was also more in the moment, less data to go with it uh, after game three. But these are some adjustments or at least line of quirks that I think are worth noting uh, for game four. Andre Jackson, he's a big key in this. He did not play in game one. He played garbage time only five minutes in game two, and then 17 minutes in game three. Ty Windish, who I had on here, predicted that that could be an adjustment. The Bucks go to from a lineup perspective. He was plus seven in game three. He made half his, uh, only two shots, but he made half his two shots. He had a steal. He fouled a lot, but his defensive activity was like noticeable. He was like spry and young on this old team. He looked good. He's going to keep playing, especially if Dame can't, can't play. He's good. I like Andre Jackson. Um, the thing that stood out, is like what he is. He is a good player. Let's be totally clear about Andre Jackson. Again, there's a reason he's playing in the regular season. He took 
1.8 shots per game. Shots in his 10 minutes average. He took 0.8 threes per game. He had less than one assist per game. He's an energy guy. He's a ball mover, right? He's good at that stuff. That's what he was good at at UConn. He's not a floor spacer. I, I, occasionally he'll make threes. His percentage is good, but his volume is comically low, right? He's not a shooter. He, you know, he's just not a guy that threatens you that much offensively at all. And so, uh, or, so if you're the Pacers and you know that that's a non-threat, right? Maybe he can cut you to death, but if you just stick with him, you'll have a chance. That is a guy. That is the best place to put Obi Toppin for the Pacers in this series. And that's noteworthy because, in general, like the best place so far to put Toppin has been either on a shooter like a Malik Beasley or a Jay Crowder, where he's got to move at least or like be very cognizant all the time, or on Bobby Portis at the five down low. You've seen that a lot. And when the Bucks go Portis at the five, that's when you've seen the Toppin Siakam front court. Now there's another spot to put him out there. And I think that means Toppin could play a little more. He was really good in the first half of game three, not so good in the second half. Uh, but he changed the game, right? They, he was getting chance from the crowd. He had finished with 15 and six. I think 14 were in the first half, right? He's a good player. He's won a round in the playoffs before. I would not be surprised if Andre Jackson's inclusion means you see a little more top and maybe he gets to 20 minutes, just soaks up all those Jalen Smith minutes that I imagine will go away after game three. And it just all goes to Obi Toppin. And they have a new spot to put him. That is a little easier for him. It's not somebody that can really shoot it. It's not some bang in their post-up threat like Portis. I think that's the best spot for an Obi Toppin. And now we have data. I did mention this a little bit after the last game, but uh, Obi Toppin guarded, you know, you end up guarding everybody for a couple seconds throughout the course of a game. And the NBA does track this for tracking data. Obi Toppin only guarded two players for more than 46 seconds in game three. And they were both almost three minutes, way over two. It was Bobby Portis, and it was Andre Jackson Jr. So my hunch already stands that that's what the Pacers are going to do, is put him on those two guys. But specifically having somewhere else to put him allows them to change their rotation in a meaningful way. Maybe that means Toppin can be the first sub again. Uh, ben Shepard got in pretty early in the last game. Again, it's too early to say. It might depend on who starts for the Bucks and how that changes things, but... I find the addition of uh, Andre Jackson Jr. into the Bucks rotation very interesting. Uh, thing two that I'll be watching for in this game. Pacers, can they keep going? Will they keep going? Do they need to keep going with the Siakam strategy they used uh, in game three? The Bucks clearly sent him more defensive attention. It was so obvious uh, throughout the course of the game. And you can look through the matchup data on him and see that he was defended <laughs> quite a bit differently in this game. Patrick Beverly ended up on him. More often, Brooke Lopez was on him less often. Than he's been the past Portis almost 10 minutes on him. Chris Middleton ended up on him a lot, which is to say a few things. The fact that so many guys reached almost two minutes of time on him and Portis had a bunch of time. One, they switched back to front court matchups. It was Lopez on him a lot in the first two games. They went to Portis and that freed up Miles Turner. But two, they were doubling a lot. And that's why the other guys ended up being the closest defender and getting all these times and partial possessions guarding Siakam. And, and, I, and I tweeted one out. There were a lot of them. You know, he was getting doubled in the post and he was in the first quarter and the double comes and it's Middleton and Portis on Siakam. And here's what the Pacers did. They did two things. One, Siakam just read the doubles very well and he got it out, whether that was to the shooter, whether that was to Turner, whoever, specifically on this play. And then again, in overtime, you saw this, although it was a little different scenario in the overtime period. Andrew Nemhard went to the dunker spot on the opposite side. So what that does is Nemhard's man can't be the guy who runs over to double, right? Sometimes Dame, whoever. Dame was very rarely the guy. They don't want it to be Dame. It's, you know, he's got to be working on defense in that case. And that's, you know, if Siakam sees that quick enough, that's an easy pass for a layup on the opposite side. Especially if the Pacers can space, which with Halbert and Neesmith Turner around that, you can space. So they would send someone down to double team Siakam that isn't in the dunker spot. And so Nemhard's being guarded down there. And so that means a shooter is open. So Siakam would get it out and then a bucket could come from someone on the perimeter or they could attack to crack defense. And then the overtime period, because of that, that meant the guy rotating over to stop Miles Turner when he got into the lane was a small. It was it was Dame, and so, or it was Patrick Beverly. And so Turner just scored that skying layup for the first bucket of overtime. So not only was the adjustment how to handle the Siakam extra pressure coming in the doubles, they were ready for it. They also had a Nemhard in a creative spot that helped a lot, not just with Siakam, but also with Turner stuff. So Miles needs to keep moving, right? Make Lopez keep moving defensively. He's a great drop coverage defender. He's very good around the basket. He swatted TJ McConnell shot into the millionth row in game one. But moving is not his thing, right? Especially if he has to do it all game long. So if that keeps happening as a strategy 
for the Bucks in this game. I think the Pacers know what they need to do with, with them hard. And of course the Bucks will probably just that. And they know how they need to get their shooters to the right spot. Since Yakum knows what he needs to do to get it out. And he'll be ready if they change that up at all. I mean, he's been so good in this series. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about some final adjustments to close out this weekend episode before we do so, though. Let's very quickly talk about FanDuel. It's playoff time. The NBA and the NHL. Baseball in full swing. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers on FanDuel get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed. That's awesome. It's a lot of money. That's 150 bucks, win or lose, just by signing up on FanDuel. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, and you can do it all on an app that's safe, it's secure, it's super easy to use. I don't know what you're waiting for. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet an automatic win on FanDuel thanks to that 150 bucks in bonus bets, America's number one sportsbook. And we're back here on Lockdown Pacers. Let's close out this shorter weekend show. Thanks for making us your first listen today and every day. Check out Lockdown Bucks. Hear what they're saying about Dane being hurt, about being down 2 1. My reminder I, I will predict the Pacers win game four. They were up 2 1 against the Cavs in 2018. Nothing is sealed about this series. Cavs won the next two, Pacers won game six, and obviously last game seven. There are way different dynamics now with injuries, and the teams are way different, but being up 2 1 is good. It does not mean anything for the results of the series. Continuing to push, as Siakam says, not getting too high, right? The Pacers, the, like Rick Carlisle has talked about this, and this actually is, you know, in the playoffs, it's harder to control your emotions. Like, it's got to be tricky to stay focused after wins. So they had two days off, too, after the last one, and, you know, not get too caught up in exactly what you're doing. Like, I heard on Dunked On they were talking about this. Like the winning team often is less inclined to adjust because they won. Their strategy worked, but you had to be forward thinking, right? That is the challenge of the and the balance of the playoffs and the coaching staff and all the players is to figure all that out. Um, a lot of positive reviews, by the way, of Miles Turner's film watching and his growth since the Pacers' last playoff berth at practice and after the last game. I'll have a story about that later today if you guys are interested in that. He was so good, so good in game four or game three, excuse me. Um, and did a great job punishing the switch the Bucks made in the front court. That's going to be huge again, right? If Brook Lopez is on him, Turner's just being quick and being able to make threes and spread him out. It opens up the lane for the Pacers. It opens up space for Miles Turner to score, and he took advantage of all of it. And he's got to, again another adjustment that could be good for the Pacers in Game Four. How about making some threes? <laughs> How about just putting them in the basket? They went three and ten in the regular season when they shot twenty six and a half percent from three or worse. So the fact that they were able to squeak that one out in the playoffs, big stage, overtime, things not going their way. They hit huge threes. Neesmith hit one, obviously. You know, to hit huge threes in a game like that was unbelievable. Everybody thought, including me, that they made more than that because they were so timely. Um, something that's been interesting in this series, and I have this is this is this kind of blew my mind. The pace of the game has been a big factor to me in the Pacers' success, right? They've even said they tried to play faster. The Bucs have talked about the pace and the speed. And the Bucs, to their credit, slowed game three down and really made it their kind of crawling game. Not so slow, but slower. And when the pace is their pace, they look better, right? The team that sets their tempo and can get into their own flow and rhythm usually wins a game, or at least has a better chance. Well, if you look at the stats of just the amount of time, and some of this is, is skewed by a huge halftime deficit, forcing the Pacers to play differently. The Pacers' fastest offensive pace game, the game where they got a shot up the quickest in the half court on offense, is game one. <laughs> they took 12.6 seconds per offensive position in game one, 13.6 in game two, and then 14.9 in game three. So slowed down in game three, more Bucksy. They were really fast in game one. My theory there is what I just said. They were down 30 at halftime and they had, they were out of time. They had to play so fast in the second half to keep up in that game. Uh, but the Bucks have slowed them down right from game two to three. The defensive pace is what the Pacers got in their favor. That's where you can see the game sped up. It has gotten faster from game one to three, but the Bucks did well to, you know, have it be more their pace and their their defensive paces where they want it. And you could see it change over the course of a game. So really, I think it's interesting that the Pacers numerically have gotten slower every game, but I think that that lacks the context of the game mattering, right? Like it being close 
and the overtime possessions were slow and the late game possessions were slow does skew that a bit, but you know, you can even remove second chance points, all that kind of stuff that makes possessions longer where the Pacers got a trillion offensive rebounds, um, you know, in the overtime period. And even then, you know, their offensive pace has been steadily getting slower, but it's not just about that. It's about more. It's about the pressure. It's about getting the ball from out of bounds. Get, keeping the Pacers at their pace, I think, is going to be really important in this game. And really where you see the pace settle in and where the results matter the most is with the defensive pace, how long they're making the Bucks play on that end. If they make the miss after a long possession, it's generally, of course, advantageous any miss. Um, I think that's going to be a key in this game. Can the Pacers get back to playing their pace? Can they get that D pace down more to what it was in game two? 17 almost seconds per Bucks possession in that game. Very slow. Pacers were much faster. And the difference in offensive pace and defensive pace was by far the widest in that game. So that's what I'll be looking for. Can the Pacers set their speed, set their tempo in this game in a way that they did in the first quarter of game three? They did it for most of game two, but not the rest of game three. They still did enough to win that game, of course. Uh, we'll see how it goes. That's all the adjustments I had written down from game three. Uh, or stuff that I will be watching for. There's a lot to this, though. Like, it would have been very interesting to me to see how the Bucks adjusted to what Chris Middleton just did and see if they can get Dame going a little better and how much they kept hammering that Lillard-Lopez pick and roll. That was so threatening. Brooke Lopez only took two threes, made seven twos all right at the basket. Now they don't have Dame anymore. And part of the reason that was working so well is because of the gravity Dame had. So I had to toss that adjustment out. And he might play, and then that will become a big thing to monitor, right? He was stumbling towards the basket. Lopez wasn't finishing those plays. But if that can't happen as much or Patrick Beverly can't, you know, really control pick and rolls or whoever starts instead isn't too threatening a ball handler, it's going to be tough for the Bucs to score. So the Pacers defense is the key to me. I'm just wondering if they can hold the Bucs to 105 to 110 like they have in regulation. So far in regulation for the Pacers in the series, 108, uh, 109, 108, 111. That should be enough for them to win if they can continue to hold them at that level, make some threes, find a way to keep Toppin involved. They have a better spot to put him defensively. Keep rolling with their Siakam strategy. They should be able to pull out a win. But all season, they have not earned the benefit of the doubt in these settings. Can't wait. I'll be there again if you're going to be there. I hope you have a great time. And maybe we're running into each other. I do roam around, especially at halftime, quite a bit. Uh, it's hard to sit down for, for that long. Looking forward to it. After this game, uh, it will not be a solo podcast. I'm doing it with uh, Miller Time Pod, Dave Searle. Again, love talk, talking with him. and then. Monday night, it'll be Camille will return from Lockdown Bucks to catch up on the series after four games. So lots of fun stuff coming here, all coming after game four before the series shifts back to Milwaukee. Hope you guys enjoyed today's show. I'm on Twitter at Tony Aris. The show is there at Lockdown Pacers. Hope you all are having a great weekend. We'll see you later after game four.